Hello, thank you. Uh, what I intend to do today is to make the case for building your organizations around your people. I'm going to do this in two parts. Firstly, I'm going to look at how the world has changed, and then I'm going to make the case uh, for why uh, people centricity is the only way forward. And hopefully, I will bring together what we have covered to date with what we are going to cover in the next session. So let's begin. To understand how the world has changed, we need to go back a few years. So, 240,000 generations ago, our ancestor first picked up a rock, uh, came down from the trees, and waved goodbye to his chimpanzee family. If we fast forward to 72,000 generations ago, our ancestor first picked up a rock for the purposes of doing something or someone. That was a major day for mankind because on that day we decided to augment ourselves. On that day uh, we took control of our own destiny and on that day the technology industry was created. Since then we've seen exponential growth in terms of new technology. We've seen the wheel, the printing press, uh, that ill-fitting exoskeleton that many refer to as a car, more recently, we've seen the desktop computer and the smartphone. So in many respects, today is a cause for celebration, because such is the nature of exponential technology growth uh, that today is the fastest day we have ever experienced. But by the same token, it's the slowest day we will ever experience again. So the uncertainty and volatility that we're experiencing today is simply a warm-up act for what is to come. Many of us will have experienced the digital tsunami. Some of us will have experienced it in terms of defunct business models or career-ending automation. We all got to face disruption firsthand as a result of COVID. Despite what the media tells you, there is no new normal, there is no next normal. Abnormal and thus continual disruption will be the backdrop to our lives going forward. And digital and biology are just two of the forces. We have political, economic, social, legal, environmental, the war for natural resources, and the war for talent. For those of us who are thinking that disruption is coming to an end, well, that's not the case. These forces are both compounding and conflating to make the future unknowable. Disruption is only just taking off its tracksuit. Many organizations today are based on industrial era principles, i.e. the factory model. They will struggle as the world becomes more unpredictable. In many respects, the factory and the societies that have emerged from the factory are akin to the matrix, as depicted in that iconic film of the same name. Despite the economic benefits it has given us, the comfort, the convenience, deep down we have a sense that something is not right. So we have a choice. We can take the blue pill and stay oblivious deep within the matrix, or we can take the red pill and discover the unpleasant yet liberating reality. So what I'm going to do now is look at the matrix through a number of different lenses. And then we will look at how to escape the matrix. So firstly, the operating model. The factory model, uh, which I think is embraced by most established businesses uh, and organizations and banks, is based on efficiency. It's predicated on efficiency. 
This is why we have Lean, Six Sigma, Business Process Engineering, Total Quality Management. It's an efficiency play. And the only reason we have people in this factory model is because the technology has not matured enough to replace them. So people are used in the traditional uh, business model as technology placeholders. Now the thing is, as humans, we have a tendency to be curious, to be creative, to even be courageous. Now if you do that in a bank, you will have a stern conversation with HR. You are supposed to simply follow the operations manual. In this respect, the factory model is genetically mutilating us. It is suppressing our natural desire to be human. If we look at this now through the lens of technology, we are told that we should digitalize everything. We are hearing that from the World Economic Forum. Sprinkle your old school business model with technology pixie dust and you will be forever safe. And what's not to like about faster, smarter, cheaper? Well, a faster, smarter, cheaper Titanic at the end of the day is still a Titanic. And even one optimized to detect icebergs is no match for air travel. Simply trying to automate, simply trying to digitalize your old school business model is not enough. From a talent perspective, we have seen the automation of blue collar work. We're now seeing the blue collarization of white collar work. None of us are safe. None of us know what we will be doing in a few years time. The new definition of talent, if you like, is being able to do something of value that an algorithm or a robot cannot do. This involves our cognitive potential, our creativity, our ability to pattern match, to thinking concepts, or to pick out weak signals in very small data sets. The banks, as many of you well know, are on a race to the bottom, to automate everything. Eventually, they will become technology factories. They will be 100% efficient, but approximate, they'll be operating at approximately 0% margin because all the other banks will be doing the same. Through the lens of leadership, the traditional leadership model is very, very centralized. This leads to sclerotic decision-making, missed opportunities, fumbled management of threats. The belief is that all the brains are in that well-appointed room in the building, and everyone else's uh, brains are of no use. That is a tremendous waste of cognitive potential. In many respects, the people are perceived as disposable. And in that respect, HR might as well be an extension of the procurement function. The problem with the factory model is that it's focused on making a handful of shareholders even richer. But that's not totally the problem. The main problem is that it leads to short-term thinking, which is not good for your talent, which is not good for your society, and most of all, is not good for the planet. And if we look at this from a societal perspective, we've seen the internet allow us to communicate with each other. We've seen the internet of things allowing devices to communicate with each other. As portables become wearables, as wearables become embeddables, the Internet of Things will become the Internet of Things in people. We're on a convergence course with technology. And that convergence course started the day we first picked up that rock. You might even say that we are going through a species change from Homo sapiens to Homo extensis, or 
augmented man. Now, whether you believe we are going through a species change or not, we are becoming augmented. And the important point for the banking industry is that augmented people require augmented services. And perhaps a worrying trend is that we are spending more and more of our lives staring at glass. We are spending more and more of our time in the digital realm, and thus we are making ourselves more susceptible to being programmed. You might argue that the metaverse is the final chapter in the matrix, where we spend all our lives in a state whereby we can be just programmed on a very regular basis. So, where are we? Where we are today, we focus on profit, the leadership model is very centralized, the operating model is that of a factory. And you might say, well, it's not ours isn't a factory. Um, well, it is, it's just that it's data that's going along the conveyor belt. Technology is being used primarily for automation, and people are primarily cogs in the machine. This is taking us down a very dark, dystopian path. And perhaps this is, we're in a more advanced state in places like the UK and so on in this respect, but um, in general, we're not in a good path. And of course, it's not sustainable. So, how do we escape from the matrix? Well, there are some organizations out there that fail on a very regular basis. But oddly, they're very, very successful. Amazon spends a lot of its time continually tinkering with its fulfillment centers. Facebook, at any given time, has 10,000 experiments on the go. We need to remember that the um, the price of experimentation is failure, and experimentation is the only path to innovation. Looking at this in a slightly different way, Netflix updates its business model every four minutes. Google, wait for it, every 15 seconds. And one more, Amazon every four seconds. These organizations are highly adaptive. They can navigate an unknowable future. The problem for the traditional banks is that because of their focus on efficiency, they see failure as wasteful. And the problem is that you will not get sufficiently high uh, failure velocity and thereby innovation velocity in order to cope with an increasingly volatile world. The very nature of an unknowable world is that it will present us with, with, new, with novel situations. These novel situations cannot be responded to um, you know, using a playbook or an operations manual by virtue of the fact that they're novel. We need to respond innovatively. People are absolutely key. The cognitive potential of people is absolutely key to innovation. But people plus technology is the way to do it. Natural versus arti plus artificial intelligence. So technology has a very, very important role to play beyond automation. So as we saw earlier uh, with Chris's presentation, things like AI, IoT, blockchain, um, quantum computing, and so on, these are game changers. But they're only going to be game changers if they are combined with the cognition of humans. Earlier on, I mentioned that the banks are in a race to the bottom in terms of um, becoming technology factories. They will realize that in order to move back up the value stack, they need to reintroduce people. 
But these people won't be corporate compliance suits. These are people whose thoughts and innovations give rise to differentiated customer experiences that command a high margin. These are people like Salvador Dali, Lady Gaga, Pablo Picasso. Brilliant at what they do, but perhaps a little bit of a HR nightmare. Now, I'm not an anthropologist, but I've studied the work of anthropologists. And I've identified certain anthropological drivers, if you like, that we need to incorporate into our organizations if we are going to get the best from our people. And companies like Microsoft and Google and Apple, they've essentially baked these into their environments. They recognize that the future of their organization is totally based on their ability to harness or harvest the cognitive potential of their people. In many respects, they are building cognitive gymnasiums where the people who work for the organization are cognitive athletes. And these athletes want to go to the gym to work with other great athletes to improve their own performance, their own path to mastery, but at the same time, benefiting the organization as well. So we have cognitive gymnasiums, that's the organization, cognitive athletes, that's the talent, and cognitive coaches, that's you, the leaders. This, I believe, is the future of talent management. Looking again at uh, leadership, we've already seen that the command and control model is already too, is, you know, just too slow. We need to really think about, well, what is leadership? Imagine watching a football match, and imagine the two captains chasing the ball all around the pitch and shouting instructions to the player who's closest to the ball. That makes no sense. The person who's closest to the ball is the leader at that point in time. So I believe we need to build organizations where everybody is a leader. If you manage another person, if you influence another person, you're a leader. So this is taking us away from centralized leadership to decentralized leadership. We might even call it distributed leadership or even ubiquitous leadership. Leadership everywhere. And what I think is gonna, you're going to find quite painful is that we're moving into a world now where strategic planning is becoming a genre of fiction. How do you know what's going to happen in three months? That's a challenge. Think of the fighter pilot who goes up in the air having planned his or her maneuvers and not just the maneuvers, but the order in which they are going to take place, well, they won't be in many dogfights. As philosopher Mike Tyson pointed out, the plan goes out the window after the first punch. Situational awareness trumps strategic planning. We are essentially moving into a post-strategy world. And smart leaders recognize that job number one is to acquire and retain the best talent. And they can do that by creating a cognitive gymnasium and building up the levels of trust where they can become a cognitive coach to their cognitive athletes. There are some organizations out there that are not just focused on making a profit. In fact, they're more focused on growing assets. Amazon sees your wallet as an asset, or wallets in general as an asset class. Facebook, similarly with your mind. John Deere, uh, Rolls-Royce, these old school manufacturing firms are seeing data as an asset class and turning it into value for their their clients. And, and the discussion earlier on today was getting into that in terms of the value of data. The thing about focusing on assets in general is that assets provide you with a buffer against an uncertain future. Assets allow you to take more risks. 
and assets allow you to acquire and retain the best people. What we need to remember is the most important asset of all, the planet. It's this asset on which all the other assets rely. And we need to think of it in terms of natural capital. And we need to try and live off the interest rather than eating into the principal. So, this is the path that we are on by default. This is the matrix path. And what I've highlighted here is we're playing, or that game was optimized for the finite game, the industrial era. We knew the rules of the game. We knew how to score and tell who was winning. Well, that's changing. Where we need to get to, as we've just covered, is we need to have organizations focused on growing assets, ubiquitous leadership, leadership everywhere. Um, we need to operate as a living organism because we're now having our people operate as humans. Ideally, we would capitalize on our tribal tendencies, our ability to sense what's happening, decide what to do on the basis of that, and then act. Sense, decide, act, sense, decide, act continuously. Less an inert factory, more a living, sensing organism. And we can use technology more than just for automation. Automation's okay, uh, but the real value comes through innovation. And we need to treat our people as cognitive athletes. Less cog, more cognitive athlete. Less bolt, more Usain bolt, so to speak. We're leaving the finite game, and we're moving into the infinite game. And in the infinite game, there is only one rule. And the rule is to stay in the game. That's it. We're back on the savanna, survival of the most adaptable. And I've written there, not dystopian. Perhaps I should have written utopian. The problem with utopia, or not the problem, the definition of utopia is that we get both freedom and security. What's actually happening in practice is we are trading security for freedom. We're going into a more dangerous world, but we will be liberated. And it will feel dangerous, but it will also feel very human. This is how we're wired. We're wired to operate in dangerous, harsh environments, except we've kind of forgotten that over the last 12,000 years. So, the world is changing. The world of work is changing. Um, we are leaving the industrial era. You might regard COVID as the unofficial closing ceremony for that. People are returning to their true nature, uh, but they're becoming augmented. And that's the twist. The 20th century was the era of IT. The 21st century is the era of biology. What with developments in synthetic biology, genomics, bionics, bioinformatics, and even nootropics. The augmentations we're going to see over the next few years is going to be profound. Again, this has profound implications for us as service providers. But aren't we also going to be this augmented talent? This has profound implications for us as consumers, as citizens, and in that most exacting of management sciences, parenting. I believe we need to build cognitive gymnasiums staffed with cognitive athletes led by cognitive coaches. We need to embrace our humanity in ways that we have not done for centuries. If we are to escape the matrix and live as nature intended, I encourage you to take the red pill. Thank you.